goal, quantify the reliability of remotely sensitivity products for use in the Kimberley. So right, we can measure turbidity, suspended sediment, concentration, how confident are we in those measurements. If we're trying to detect change or extreme events at processes, we need to have some confidence in the product. So we went through the process of um, developing an algorithm, analysing sensitivity comparing to other algorithms to give us some level of confidence in the product and then use the remote sensing products, analyse the time series to look at patterns, if you like, regional patterns in turbidity. Well, and, well, that's kind of a step-by-step -step, um, list of deliverables for the project, essentially develop an algorithm and test the determine the sensitivity compare it to other algorithms and then analyse the time series to look at regional patterns in turbidity. There was a picture there. It's gone. We messed with the slides a bit and uh, oh well. It was to introduce the concept of remote sensing that a, a satellite born sensor measures radiance, it measures light coming from the Earth's surface. Um, and from that we can get reflectance, if you like, 
and from reflectance can produce a colour picture. And there was a coloured picture on the Earth from space there. You then have to apply an algorithm, the sort of optics or physics based processing methodology that then converts those radiance measurements to a geophysical product. And there's an example of suspended sediment concentration from motors. So sensors don't measure concentration, they measure radiance, and we then have to interpret that to derive a product. And the question is how good is that product? There's a, an example of a Landsat, what we call true colour, colour photograph up on the right, and then a dry product, which is suspended sediment. First step was to develop an algorithm. Now there are, oh, this one with 50, 60, sort of something like 70 different TSS algorithms in the literature that we could find for the last 10 years. And you can go and grab them off the shelf and use it. Um, but as I said, crossover with the dredge node project, we were able to go and collect in situ data, um, take careful measurements of surface reflectance, TSS concentration, and develop our own algorithm, which we would say is kind of locally tuned for the waters of the northern Western Australia. But one of the keys to it was that it's a physics-based or optics-based algorithm rather than just fitting lines or curves um, to a certain <coughs> situ data. We also had to take into account uh, atmospheric correction. That's a kind of key process. There's funny noises coming out of the machine now. So we, we took surface reflectance measurements with an instrument called the Dalek. It's a surface radiometer. Um, and we compared different atmospheric correction algorithms and decided this was the best approach, the, the MUM algorithm, doesn't matter what it is, but the MUM worked really well. As I mentioned, there's different ways of, of kind of characterising the algorithm. The top left is our physics-based, optics-based equation. The, the shape of the curve is based on an understanding of optics in water absorption and scattering. A lot of algorithms in the literature are empirically based. The top right is kind of a linear model, bottom right as an exponential model. And they work to different degrees. <coughs> as I said, there's been sort of 70 or so in the literature, all locally tuned, based on in situ measurements from all different places around the world. So we developed ours and did some, we've got a, we've got a pointer thing. In the middle, um, there's absolute relative error. Ours is about 31%. Um, the linear model 53%, the exponential about 39%. Oh, awesome. Yeah, there you go. It was so if you like, this, this gives an idea of first cut uncertainty in the TSS products from this type of algorithm. So the, the form of the algorithm, algorithm does have an impact on the accuracy. So the, the, the data points, <coughs> these are in situ data points. So it's um, based on in-situ reflectance and TSS measurements. So we're happy with our form of algorithm. Then we compared our algorithm with the, um, I'll, I'll count them in a sec, that's the 70 or 80 different published algorithms from the literature. We grabbed everything we could for the last 10 years, coded them all up. We used hydrolyte to develop a synthetic, synthetic data set of reflectance. We put in all different TSS types, different chlorophyll concentrations, um, different CDOM amounts, dissolved organic matter, different wind speeds, sun angles, and all, all the parameters we could think of. Um, so there's 49 MODIS algorithms and 27 Landsat algorithms for TSS. We apply them all to the synthetic data set. Um, many are empirical, and there are some that are kind of semi analytical. Ours are kind of optics, physics based. Ran them all, compared them all, and this is one example of hundreds of output plots. So across the bottom are the different algorithms. These are the empirical, and then at the end, some of the analytical algorithms, most are empirical. We came up with a scoring system. So the, the bars, high scores, tall bars, low scores, short bars. So you can 
can see some algorithms perform well, some not so well. Each horizontal plot at the top is yellow clay, red clay, so it's a different set of types. <coughs> we did this all again for different chlorophyll concentrations, different seed ohms, different scattering parameters, a whole lot of stuff. We did this many, many, many times. And for each of those tests, we scored all the algorithms. Here it is for Landsat as well. And at the end of the whole lot, we come up with a grand score of all the algorithms. And we, in the published paper, we, we rank to the top three or four. And ours is equal to the top three or four. It's up, up there. So we're confident in the form of the algorithm. We're confident that it's about the best you can do. The, the idea of this paper was to assess, if you like, transferability of the algorithm or the robustness of the algorithm that if you have a system that you know nothing about optically, you can take these algorithms and expect them to be working relatively well, as best as you can expect. There are some algorithms that work brilliantly in only one location. They're ultra-tuned for that location, but you can't transfer them. So the question here was robustness or transferability. So across all the different conditions, these three or four algorithms are quite robust and you can expect them to do about the best that anything should be done. Not saying anything that all is perfect, but they are robust. Paper just submitted is on um, the effect of spatial resolution on um, reporting TSS. Um, the bottom line is if the water is quite uniform spatially, then different spatial resolution sensors can report about the same TSS. But if the water varies a lot spatially, like in sediment plumes, uh, dredging plumes, or river outflows, then the spatial resolution of the sensor has a big impact on the TSS levels reported. It's important if you're doing, say, compliance monitoring, if you set an upper limit as reported by remote sensing, Modus, for instance, might report you know, 30 milligrams, and Landsat might report 80. And if the limit is 50, Landsat says you're over the limit, and Modus says you're under the limit. So it's just worth being aware that um, spatial resolution is important in certain situations. So we've got to the point now, we have an algorithm that we're happy it works. Um, it's the best we can do. We've now processed all the data and I'll hand over to Jim to talk about analysing the time series and all that. Then I'll come back to the end. Thanks, Pete. So, um, so as Pete said, we've applied this algorithm to the entire um, MODIS uh, archive. <coughs> so in fact, there are two MODIS instruments on board two separate satellites. And there's a potential then for, they're in slightly different orbits. There's a potential for two images a day. Um, and so that's what, we, that's what we've got. We've got two, two images a day, potentially, for 16 years. Um, except, of course, um, things like cloud you know, can get in the way of that. <coughs> all the images, uh, all these maps have been stacked so that the spatial points match up into a kind of data queue and that means that you can just pick a location anywhere and extract the entire time series. Um, so that's a really useful way of arranging the data and I'm going to show you some of that time series analysis that we've done. Um, so let's just start by looking looking at some basic statistics. On the left hand side is the 16 year mean. Um, and notice that the color scale is logarithmic. The highest <coughs> concentrations by far are found in King Sand, according to the satellite. And there are other patches, like some offshore patches um, of lower TSS <coughs> are, are of interest. Um, there's some high signals in Collier Bay, perhaps, and um, Walker Inlet. One important thing to say is that the algorithm um, does well up to about 100 milligrams per litre. And above that, it underestimates TSS. From our analysis, and I know from looking at in-situ data that sometimes TSS can go very high in, in 
base level or per inlet. So we don't expect it to capture that. So right near where the rivers um, enter, um, we're likely to be underestimating TSS, I think. The other important thing to say is that the variance in TSS is bigger, it, it's bigger than the mean. And so on the right hand side, I've plotted the range of TSS, the maximum, minus, and minimum for every point. And you can see straight away that it's bigger than the mean everywhere, and um, especially in King Sand. So that just means that it's very variable. And we'd like to know what is driving some of that variability. So what I'm going to discuss now is the analysis, um, which is an attempt to do that. So we've used a technique called EOF analysis. It's a uh, kind of map series approach to um, uh, summarizing variability in, in 2D geophysical fields. It's used extensively in atmospheric science and oceanography. Um, and so if you, if you imagine like you've got a contour map of TSS which is evolving in time, as time passes, those contours jump around. And the EOF analysis takes all of that variability, and if you're lucky, it summarizes it into a few kind of dominant oscillations of where these spatial patterns are oscillating. Um, and uh, those oscillations are often referred to as modes of variability. Okay. The other thing to tell you is that I split the region into three subregions. That was partly for practical kind of handling. But it also turns out that those three regions are quite different. So we're going to concentrate on the central the region two, which is King Sound and Collier Bay. And I'm just going to show you an example of what we've done. So we're looking at monthly means, first of all. So we're ignoring the daily variability. And the image there shows the um, first mode of variability. It's not very interesting. It just has a high signal in King Sound pretty much zero everywhere else. Um, in fact, all that means is that this is where all the action is taking place here. This is where the variability is. And in fact, the EOF analysis that this is often referred to as a center of action, it's where the action is. Um, but the other useful thing that EOF analysis does is it gives you a time series of how <coughs> that mode oscillates. And that's what this, uh, that's what this plot is here. So this is not a time series of TSS, it's a time series of the oscillation here. And you can see that there's a uh, strong seasonal cycle um, with a major peak in the middle of the winter. The middle of the winter. Come back to that. There's also a second peak sometimes at the beginning of the year, uh, around about sort of January perhaps, sometimes a little bit later. Um, but it's smaller. So there's a dominant fluctuation in the middle of the year, there's a smaller one at the beginning of the year. Um, this is just a spectral analysis of that, and it, it says the same thing. These are cycles per year, there's a peak of one cycle per year, and a peak of two cycles per year. So that's the first mode of variability. We can look further, so this is the second mode. It looks a bit more interesting visually. It has a sort of bi mode where these two sort of regions, like close to the river mouth and a bit further out in the outer plume, are out of phase. So they're oscillating out of phase. And this is the time series of that oscillation. Um, and it had a peak at the beginning of the year now. Um, and I don't, I, I can't be sure because the, the TSS signal in here is sort of debatable because it's getting so high, the satellite might be struggling. But it might be that this, uh, this is really to do with river flow. And there's a, there's a signal here which uh, correlates with the beginning of the year when river flow is uh, at a peak. Up in the top right hand corner there is the um, discharge, volume discharge in thousands of gigalitres uh, monthly for the Fitzroy River. Um, and I put it there because it occurred to me that there might be some correlation between river flow and this signal, but it doesn't really look like it. So there's, there's some years that have very low river flow, but yet they still have a kind of similar signal. So I think we've got a bit more to try and understand about that, and we'll, that will come up again in a minute. So this is just a reality check now. That was EOF analysis I'm showing you. I was showing you. This is time series. This is the time series of TSS at four locations across King Sand. 
Um, and uh, it just shows us the same thing. You know, we can see, if we look at this one perhaps, you can see there's a peak in the middle of the winter. There's also sometimes this additional peak at the beginning of the year, which I'm suggesting is to do with river flow. As you move out, uh, as you move out, incidentally, you sometimes see these peaks dominate. So here and here, there's like a kind of peak during you know, the, the wet season um, that appear above other things. Okay, so that's um, that's a sort of reality check, if you like, on the EUF analysis. Seems to be real. There's these, these <coughs> two seasonal peaks, but we've got daily. Uh, TSS data, and so we can look at one year. We're going to look at 2010. This is the uh, this is the day of the time series for 2010 at the same locations, and you can see there's this seasonal uh, maximum in the middle of the winter, but there's also a much higher frequency um, signal. Um, and in fact, uh, you might be able to already work out that it's about twice monthly. Um, notice, by the way, that there's a lot of missing data now. That's because of cloud cover. We're looking at individual days, and it's especially poor in the beginning of the year when it's um, you know when it's raining. Okay, so we're, we're going to look in more detail now at this daily daily time series. So this is now an EOF analysis of the daily the daily estimates for 2010, and it says something very similar to the monthly one, which is the first load is. Um, unimodal, um, it's oscillating here between the river and the rest of the region. Um, this is the time series of it in black. This is, shows, the, shows the same thing, so this annual peak, um, and it's got this higher frequency variability. The second mode again has this uh, kind of bimodal, out of phase um, pattern. <coughs> The third mode, I'm not sure what to make of, but there are there are extensive kind of tidal flats to me, and I wonder whether they're um, getting involved in the signal. If you look at the spectral analysis again, you've got this peak uh, one cycle a year, but there's another peak now at 24 cycles a year, and that's the, the fortnightly um, variability. And of course, we know that that matches with springly uh, cycles and the tides. So uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, that's 2010. 2010, you may have noticed before, you might know already, was a very, a very dry year. Here it is here. Um, and I picked it um, purposefully for that reason. Um, so we're going to compare it now with 2011, which was a very wet year, the following year. This is what it looks like. And I don't know how well you remember the previous one, but it actually looks very similar. There's not much, it doesn't really respond to this sudden input of um, river water, which is kind of interesting. Um, okay, so, so we can do that for any year, right? So they're just some examples. Okay, um, so I said that I split it up into three regions. I, I haven't got time to show you sort of more detail from those other regions, but just very briefly. Um, these are the time series of those EOF um, patterns for Collier Bay and Brew. So I've separated Collier Bay out from King Sand. And you don't really see that seasonal peak anymore, but you do see the tidal um, signal, or what I'm suggesting is the tidal signal. That's what dominates, and that also dominates the Brew. So King Sand is slightly different than everywhere else, I would suggest. Okay, got that peak, I've almost finished. Yeah, so uh, this is actually the last slide. So um, I just wanted to finish up by saying something about what that tells us about what, what's controlling variability in TSS. Well, we know that there's these two seasonal peaks. There's one that coincides with the river flow. Well, that's, uh, that kind of makes sense, but it doesn't dominate. And in fact, from dry years to wet years, there doesn't seem to be much change. In fact, the dominant signal seems to be tidal, the spring leaf. Um, so it might be that in somewhere like King Sand, the soft sediment's been well, the sediment's been deposited on the river flows, but actually variability in that supply is not the thing that's um, controlling turbidity. It's the reworking of that sediment by other <coughs> processes. Um, and I'm suggesting that tidal resuspension is, is probably one of them. Um, 
And the last thing I'd like to say is that we need to think a bit more about this peak in the middle of the winter, because that surprised me. I was expecting it to coincide with the river. Yeah. It, yeah, it surprised me too, because you get strong southeast winds in winter time, so with the big tidal fluctuation and that soft bottom thing, that enhances the resuspension well, that's of right. the it tidal right. yeah. thing. On that, that's why you get it down there. Yeah, so it could be wind driven. It might also yeah. be stratification, right? That's another thing that occurred to yeah. me. Maybe that breaks down the wind, so but if you see that enhances the tidal, see the tide, you know, coming across that sort of thing. When that wind is going, it's really oh, turbid. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you think that's um, I, I, yeah, I would think that that would the wind regime will be enhancing right. the tidal yeah. suspension yeah. in winter time. Yeah, okay. And and you'd think the same with 80 Mile Beach, the same thing, because there's a lot of soft bottom off there too. Right. And, and the bottom of Roebuck Bay down Bush Bay, on, that's really muddy there too. Right, and, okay. dry, and the low tide goes right out and then comes back in again with the wind against the tide flow. You're, to show spectral profiles. So that is with a sensor that can measure light intensity at many, many wavelengths. Okay, so these are wavelengths across the bottom. We want to know how much light reaches certain depths in the water column at different spectral regions. So is it mainly red light, green light, blue light, whatever it might be. So this is for um, a depth of five metres the difference has been seven levels. So this is quite a low, this is a 2.3 milligrams per litre. It shows that, uh, all right, so this is um, red light up this end, green light, blue light at this end. It's the new leader. Huh? It's the new leader. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. So blue, ultraviolet, it's kind of blue, ultraviolet, doesn't matter. But so visible stops about, say, 400. Um, <coughs> Visible stops at about 700 of this end, so this is a visible range. So, as the sediment load increases, the percentage of light reaching 5 metres gets less and less until it's down at almost 0% for a sediment level of about 20. The other point to note is that the peak in the spectrum changes. Here, the peak is at about 450, 460, and then as the sediment goes up, the peak moves to 540. 590, so it's becoming more red. And that kind of makes sense because the soil up there is red. It absorbs, say, blue light and allows red light to propagate <coughs> or scatters more red light. So light levels decrease and they change spectrally. They decrease with depth and they decrease with sediment load. Um, what we've got here. So this is for the same sediment load at different depths. Now, the previous one was one depth, different sediment loads, and this is it. So for um, low TSS, the, the spectral irradiance gets less as we get deeper in the water column. But 
then we compare that to a high sediment load. This is up at nearly 70 milligrams per litre. The previous one, I think, was 2.3, something like that. So compare the previous one, low sediment, to high sediment. Metre depth, two metres depth, nearly five metres depth. So high sediment gets rid of all the light as well. I also change the spectrum so that we're right up at the red end of the spectrum. So of interest is the spectral nature and the light intensity, and then how much light reaches the substrate. The approach we've taken is that we can relate the TSS from remote sensing which we think is quite a robust product, we can relate that to attenuation of light. The symbol for that is K, and so we can take different wavelengths. So this is an example for K490, 490 nanometers. We can do it for any, any wavelength that we've measured, and come up with a relationship that shows um, the amount of attenuation as TSS goes up. So as TSS increases, the amount of attenuation one point to note is that it's not linear, not a linear relationship. And that's kind of important for a couple of slides down the track. So we have done this process for the complete visible spectrum and come up with attenuation coefficients related to TSS for the complete visible spectrum. And I'll talk about what we can use that for. As Jim mentioned, tides are important. So now the question is, we know how much TSS there is, how much light is going to reach the substrate, we can calculate that, but let's take into account the effect of tides as well, as the water depth changes. And we've just shown that the water depth affects the amount of light that reaches the substrate. So we've done some modelling. Um, we've done some modelling to look at the effect of tides, and this is just to show the sort of mean tide levels for different locations, five, four to five metres. So the tidal range is about double that. So the tidal range is you know, sort of roughly 10 metres, and it does significantly change the water depth. So the modelling we've done, uh, the, the slides to follow, we've taken a mean tide level of five and a half metres. We've modelled tidal ranges from one metre to 20 metres. Uh, bathymetry levels from one to 20 metres. If you get much deeper, there's no light anyway, certainly when there's lots of sediment. There's no point getting deeper than that. And we've looked at three cases, low attenuation, so um, low sediment levels, medium and high attenuation. So low, medium, high to bit of light. And just to show, um, we've based our modelling on so real data, this is real tide data for Broom, just to show the spring deep cycle. It's basically some sine curves added together. So using simple sine functions is a pretty fair way of modelling tides and light. Oh, there's a few uh, tricky diagrams just to get your head around the idea of what we're trying to do. Um, first one is the modelling the tides um, through time, through 24 hours. This is a tidal cycle. So during a neap tide, the water depth does this, follows the black line. It gets deeper and shallower. During the spring tides, the big ones, it gets deeper and shallower. So the mean tide level of five and a half metres, and there's a tidal range. If you then add that tide onto actual water depth, here's a picture of the water depth. So the depth is going from, what's that, like about 2 metres down to about 12 or 13 metres during spring tide, during the neap tide, it doesn't vary so much. So we can model, using a simple sine curve, the, the fluctuations in water depth. We then add our calculation of attenuation, the low, medium and high sediment concentration calculate the light at depth across the far spectrum, across the full visible spectrum. And so now we plot the percentage of light that reaches the substrate. Okay, so um, for low concentrations, <coughs> the 
the high range of about 10 metres, the light levels go from, that's about 90% down to about 55%. So you can imagine the light levels varying as the tides go up and down. If you add more sediment, the light levels range from about 80% down to about 20% of the surface light. Add lots of sediment, the best we can do is about 50% of the surface light down to almost 0%. So tides have a huge influence on the amount of light that reaches the substrate. So if you want to estimate the light of depth for uh, think system modeling, prime reduction, um, light limitation, you need to take into account tides when they're extreme like this at a set. The other little point to note is that um, the tide, right, the water, they will change as according to a distance like a nice smooth sign. And as I said, the attenuation relationship is not linear. So the light level doesn't follow the same pattern. It's generally low with a few short peaks of high light levels, and this is the non-linearity of the TSS versus attenuation. <coughs> it all gets a bit complicated. The idea then is how can we simplify all this and come up with a, a feeling for how important is it? Um, don't get too hung up on the little details, but what, what we're doing essentially is what if we average the light level through the middle, or what if we do it at um, the, main, the main tide level, what are the differences that, that we get, or if we just take the average bathymetry. Um, so we've got some curves, it's a bit hard to read the fonts on this screen here. Okay, so we've got a low attenuation coefficient on the left, so low, low sediment levels and high sediment level, medium, and then high sediment levels. For depth, the three curves to look at are the, the pink, the blue, and the green, and they represent different ways of averaging the light, whether you take the mean tide level or the average light levels or the sort of average depth. And it just shows that at the low concentration, there is some, some different, but as the concentration of sediment goes up, the calculations of light at depth do, do deviate. So you can't, you know, you've got to take into account the change in attenuation, or the, the, the attenuation of light at depth. You can't just take like an average depth. So, so when you get down to high sediment levels, there's a significant difference in the way of calculating, if you like, the average light. You just end up with an average light. Let's say there's different ways of averaging. You should take into account the tides. Have the line. All right, just about there. So at the end of it all, um, I'll skip a bit. This is just a, you need to also take into account when the sun is up in the sky. Um, you can't just average through time. You've got to say, are the tides in phase or out of phase with the days of sun, with the hours of sunlight. But we then take the symmetry that was used in the Rons model. And we take tide range from the ROMS model. We then run, we then take the daily modus TSS data, we run through the whole process and we calculate the average light at depth for every day. So on the left is one month's average of TSS, and on the right is our one month average of light at depth. But it's all based on daily. We take the daily modus TSS, convert that to light at depth daily, and then average through the month. And it gives you an idea of how much light is reaching the substrate during this month. We could break it down to daily. So um, blue is low light at depth, so it's really dark. Red is high levels of light at depth. Now it peaks at about 20 percent we can do this for any, any month at any time, essentially. And you can pull out numbers now from the data. So take an image of the light at depth product, pull out the location, we can look at the wrongs bathymetry, look at the tide range for that pixel, this is the TSS average for that month, and we can pull out the light at depth at high tide, light at depth at low tide, and the light at depth just accentuates the fact that maybe you don't just take one number, you could take 
be the number if you like. But the difference between 8 and 12 is not the same as 12 and 17. But it might be interesting to consider what's the lowest level, what's the highest level. Anyway, that's where we've got to with the TSS and the light of depth processing and applications to the monitoring light levels. And that's the end of our bit. Questions later, I think, is it? Well, no. well, we've got a couple of minutes. Maybe we'll just quickly <coughs> go through those now before we move on to a day so that we can... Um, I'm I just interested in how you're integrating your light at surface versus where where the water is because and, and what could be, where, where are your images? At what time of day are your images for your We've taken sensing all of the being done there? Because most of the satellites that they get me when I first talked, I tried to talk to you some years ago, Peter, remember, is that the low waters are at dawn and dusk and the higher tides are always in the middle of the day in the Kimberley. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, well, for, we've taken the solar <coughs> spectrum from that perspective, so we've related everything to... Um, well, probably it's not really relevant to the percentage, but just to let you know. We've taken the solar spectrum at the surface and then calculated light at depth. Um, and what have we done? Averaged, I think, the whole... No, we've, we've shown the light at depth for different points of the cycle. <coughs> so it's kind of... It's up to the user, maybe, to decide what to do with that. But we, we say, for this area, you go from 8% to 17% of the surface light. Now you need to know whether it's daytime or nighttime if you like. Although we, we yeah. have looked at um, the influence of in phase versus out of phase. How much light if you average through the day when you're in phase versus out of phase can vary from 16% to 36% to light. Because I'm interested in, I know Chris Tuffy's now too, on a little in the title uh, mixed the lot for the Hala Julie Seagrass yeah. bank off broom there, that its inshore limit is no particular tide level out to the deep uh, channel where at the low water springs it's all exposed, is that when the water covers it you can't see the bottom. But it's, uh, uh, and the uh, halophilas are of course the most tolerant of low light intensities. Yeah. I think there's more to be done linking what we can now do with the light modelling to like real locations. Yeah. We just sort of take an The same as Beagle Bay. You need to know exactly the local tide conditions yeah. to be able to relate now the light cycle with the tide cycle. Yeah. But we understand the relationship now between the sediment and um, the tide and the symmetry of the light. That might be the perfect segue to our days. Do you want to can you just, just a just quick on the same subject? Yep. But I just you go back to that the, the sort of map image you had where hang hey, on really. Um, so if you look at Roebuck, and this might be just the scale thing, I'm not sure. If you look at Roebuck Bay and King Sound there, a lot of the areas where um, you say a higher temperature, obviously the shallow areas where the sediment's getting entrained. But also those areas are exposed for a lot yeah. of the tight cycle. So yeah. I don't know if that confounds as, as I said, you know, let's get down to specific yeah. locations. That's further work, I think, you know. Um, was, but the general principle of relating the remote sensing to like the depth, I think we've we made good progress in that. But it's the same as the Massapete and the Baleen Reef, you can see off um, Beagle Bay there too, because a lot of that's actually low tides exposed. Yeah. And it's mostly dead coral rubble on top. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's certainly, let's look at little focus areas and, and drill down a bit more yeah, yeah, and look at the science there. Yeah, yeah. But I think the main idea was to show that we can use the remote sensing um, with time series analysis and give estimates of light at depth based on tides. To be <coughs> we might leave it there and just move on to release, so we don't run out of time.